Welcome to the Build Wealth Canada podcast, where it's all about becoming debt-free, accelerating your wealth, and taking control of your money. Now, here's your host, Cornell Schreiber. Hey, it's Cornell, and welcome to the Build Wealth Canada show. Today, we have another case study of somebody that I really respect and who has been able to achieve financial independence at a really early age. Now, no matter where you are on your financial independence journey, whether you are in the asset accumulation phase and working your way towards financial independence, or maybe you are already there or getting really close and want some insights on how to transition to this new financial independence stage in your life, I wanted this episode to help you with that. So I thought we could approach the interview from two different angles, those working towards financial independence. So here we'd be focusing on how to get there quicker and also enjoy the process and not get burned out as you're working your way towards it. And two, the other angle would be how to live a happy, fulfilling, and meaningful life once you've hit FI and have the option of retiring or semi-retiring. And spoiler alert, this doesn't just automatically happen just because you have enough money. You do actually have to think about, learn, and plan when it comes to this. At least that's been my experience. So we're going to go cover all that and much, much more in this interview with our guest today. Our guest is Steve Chu. Steve is a highly recognized influencer and speaker in the e-commerce space. His blog, mywifequitterjob.com, has been featured in Forbes, Inc., The New York Times, Entrepreneur, and MSNBC. And his podcast, My Wife Quitter Job, is one of the top 25 marketing shows on all of Apple Podcasts. He and his wife run a seven-figure e-commerce store called Bumblebee Linens, and he carries a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering from Stanford University. I really enjoyed this interview. I learned an absolute ton. Thanks so much for tuning in and supporting the show. And now let's get into the interview. All right, Steve, welcome to the show. So happy to be here. Awesome. Really enjoying your book. It just came out today. I've already been listening to it on Audible. Uh, definitely, I'm, I'm definitely hooked on it. I've been binge binge listening to it as much as one can, I think, because <laughs> I launched this morning. And so I got the notification and I've already been at it. Uh, and it's been it's been awesome. Good for, I think, people that are just starting off, but also I thought maybe it would be just for those types of people, but just as someone that already runs the podcast and the summit, I still found it really relevant because there are certain high level things, bigger picture thinking that you do as well in terms of how to structure things and all that, which I found really helpful. So definitely not just like a beginner level book, I would say from what I've uh, listened to so far. So very, very awesome. So thanks for putting all that work. It's been like three years in the making. I remember you hearing you say. That's correct. Yes. Uh, takes forever. And and thank you for your support. Appreciate yeah, yeah. No, no worries. Anything I can do, I'm, I'm happy to, to help. So, so one of my favorite things to do on this show is interview those that have achieved financial independence early, you know, where they can retire if they choose. They don't obviously have to, but have the option of doing so. And then I like to dissect and really take lessons from that journey of theirs that we can then all learn from and apply to our own lives, either to help us get to financial independence quicker and to actually be happy with the journey before and after achieving financial independence. That's big too, like not just about the money. And then, you know, kind of get to that point where we can retire if we choose. Now, there's obviously lots of different paths to get to that sort of, you know, financial independence thing or holy grail, whatever you want to call it. So for anybody hearing about you for the first time, can you tell us about your journey and how you got to early financial independence? Yeah, I'll tell the short version. So basically, my wife and I, we started a handkerchief business so that she could stay at home with the kids. And the backstory behind the hankies is uh, when we first were engaged to be married, my wife cries a lot at special occasions. So she knew she was going to be crying at the wedding. And we spent all this money on photography. And she didn't want to be seen you know, in the photos using like a, a ratty tissue to dry her tears. So we looked all over the place, couldn't find handkerchiefs anywhere except for this factory in China. So the problem is it was a factory, so you had to order a bunch. So we ordered like 200 of them, used a handful of them, and then we listed the rest on eBay just to get rid of them. And they sold like hotcakes. So fast forward, when she became pregnant, she told me she was going to quit. And where we live in California, it's, it's very expensive in order to get a good house and a good school district. So we were like, hey, why not revisit that handkerchief factory? So we got back in touch with them and just decided to launch a hanky store. And it ended up doing uh, six figures in profit in our first year, which instantly replaced my wife's salary. And so she quit in good conscience. Mm-hmm. Then after that, my friends were like, hey, how did you do it? So I decided to document all that on a blog over on My Wife Quit Her Job. 
my friends never ended up reading anything, but it started attracting just random people who were interested in e-commerce. And that blog took off. It led to a podcast, it led to a training class, led to a YouTube channel. It led to an annual e-commerce conference that I run. And that's that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you've got your podcast with Tony as well. uh, The Profitable Audience podcast. Correct. Yes. I have two podcasts. Yeah. So even if you're not into the, like I'm not an e-commerce guy at all, but the kind of the marketing piece, like as a podcaster, obviously you want to get your podcast out there. So I've I've been finding the Profitable Audience podcast really valuable um, as well. So I just wanted to give that a, a plug <laughs> because it's one of my favorite podcasts for sure. Nice, cool. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And Tony's hilarious the way she just jabs at you sometimes. <laughs> I know. Yeah, a I... woman. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. So so is that it in terms of kind of what you wanted to to talk about about your journey? Do you think, or is there anything? Yeah, else pretty much. Uh-huh. Pretty much. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, I don't want to bore people with the story. I mean, and just get into the guts. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. The interview. So awesome. Awesome. So I've been following you, uh, your work for a long time now, and it's clear you definitely don't need to be working at all anymore. Uh, I definitely don't need to be taking on any new income producing projects in your semi-retirement. I- I'm guessing I could call you semi-retired, right? Cause you work like 20 hours a week or so. Wait, yeah. I, you know, I'll be straight up. I'm probably never going to retire mm-hmm. just because the stuff is pretty fun and it's rewarding and it's actually not, it doesn't feel like work. Let's yeah. Say. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, yet it seems like you know you keep taking on significantly large projects. Like you have your YouTube channel that you launched and worked a lot on to get it to where it is today, and and then of course you have your you know giant book launch today, which we talked about. You know, and you mentioned in the past that you've been working on this book now for three years. All this takes up a good amount of time, obviously, and I imagine it's really not about the. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine it's really not about the money anymore for you. So. What keeps you going? Why not just relax or at least scale things back a little bit? I mean, I think it's just my personality. I I can't just sit here and lie, lie on the beach, yeah. right? And sit, my, that's like not my ideal life. Uh, so to answer your question about how it all gets done, I generally don't move on to another project until I've kind of automated the last project. And I always do things in, in seasons or years, I should say. I'll take on something, I'll work on it really hard for a year, learn how to automate it, and then I move on. I just make sure I have it in my schedule so that I can maintain it for forever, basically. Mm-hmm. So let's let's take YouTube, for example. That was one of the examples you gave. Um, to most people listening, creating a video every week sounds like a lot of work, right? But what I did was I hired an editor over in the Philippines. And I trained her how to edit the videos the way I wanted. And I also have a, a writer now who you know helps with the, the script and the content. So now, I'll, and I have this setup, which you guys are looking at right now, where I have a camera right here. I just film it in front of my bookshelf. And it literally takes me like 20, 25 minutes to film it. I throw it overboard to the editor. And so the YouTube channel now doesn't take that much time. And then I knew that I could move on. Uh, you asked about the book. Um, the book is something, again, it, it took three years. And it's not like a continuous work three years. It's kind of bursty. The book is something that I'm not sure if I'm going to do again, but it was on my bucket list. And it's a lot of work. But that one is bounded. It's going to be over literally by the end of this week in terms of promotion and everything. So, gotcha. But I guess why, even after all the automation, something like a YouTube, even once the book is written, there's still going to be a little bit work you're going to probably want to do in terms of promoting it and whatnot. And then with the YouTube, like it's something you have to keep doing. So even when it's sort of optimized to the max, let's say, it's still time out of your day that you could be doing sure, it. And and, and, yeah. it, and then you don't need the money, right? Um, and again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's, it seems like that's not really the main thing anymore. So why do it at all? Is it because it gives you fulfillment? Like, is it creative stimulation, intellectual stimulation? Like, there's got to, I'm guessing it checks some bucket in your brain that makes yeah. you feeling happy and fulfilled. That that doesn't, because you don't have the, the money thing is not longer their main driver. Right. Well, so let me just tell you this. So, I used to be an engineering director in charge of microprocessor design. So, I actually, a lot of the stuff that I've designed in the past is in all the cell phones today doing noise cancellation. <laughs> that was a job that I really loved. It just didn't make sense for me to continue working there with all the money coming in from all the businesses. But I miss it. I miss that mental stimulation. I miss working with brilliant people. And so, as you mentioned, I'm the type of person that needs to needs mental stimulation. And so that's the why, that's the reason why I do the things that I do. Uh, and that's why I probably never plan on retiring because I I love constantly learning. I can't just sit there on the beach and do nothing. Gotcha. And 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 you mentioned money, and I don't need the money. 
Um, that's true. But money is kind of like this measuring stick for everything that I do. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't explicitly need the money, but having money coming in is nice, right? I mean, like the YouTube channel in itself is enough, makes enough to support the entire family and the expenses. Making the other businesses just kind of gravy. I always like to optimize for sleeping at night. Like, I don't have to, I don't want to worry about money uh, per se, but I'm not extravagant by any means. In fact, my friends always call me extremely frugal. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's the way I like to live. Gotcha. Yeah, the reason I'm really sort of hammering this this question and trying to kind of go deep on it is because I'm sure you've encountered this as well, just in terms of people starting their businesses. And like I'm in the personal finance investing, financial independence, early community. And in there, and, and I've experienced this myself, before we hit our financial independence number, it was all working really hard to be able to mm -hmm. get there. And I had this illusion that now that I've interviewed many people who have also become financial independent early, it's, there's this common thing about, oh, once I hit that number, like, you know, the 4% rule, things of that nature, I can yeah. just relax, stop working, do the beach thing. And then what I found in my own experience, like for me, I lasted six months before I was like, this, this is not sustainable. Because kind of like you, like you need that intellectual stimulation, creative outlet, that, like that there's something to that, <laughs> maybe the way you're wired or whatever, but I, I hear you. So after six months, I needed something kind of extra. And it's been a very common thread that I've noticed with everybody that I've interviewed who have also hit FI early. And I see that with you as well. And so it's it's just interesting to hear and also sort of battle this misconception that I think is out there where just work really hard, make lots of money, and then retire on a beach. That's actually not realistic once you hit it, at least for, I think at this point, 100% of the people that I've talked to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The case. yeah. Yeah. I mean, here's the problem. If you're not used to having money, or if you get a sudden windfall due to a business, uh, the instinct isn't to just kick back and relax. You, you end up getting like, I, I'll just describe my experience. I don't want to speak for everybody. But I got this fever where I was like, wow, I'm making all this money. Why not try to make more and more and more? And it got to the point where I was working so hard on my businesses at one point that the whole reason I started the business was to hang out with family, but I wasn't hanging out with them as much anymore because I had all these, I'd taken on all these projects. And it wasn't until my wife really sat me down and said, hey, we don't need any more money. I don't see why you're like setting all these crazy goals for us. When we don't even spend a fraction of what we make, the whole reason we, why we started the business was so we could hang out with family. So just remember that. Mm -hmm. And that's when I became a lot more conscious of everything. And that was incidentally the impetus for writing the book. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. In a way to summarize kind of what we're talking about, would it would it be fair to say that, okay, you do these extra projects, you take on writing the book, you take on the YouTube channel, even though you don't need to, is it because at the end of the day, it's fun and it's something, it's almost like a game, it's a new challenge. And then we talked about the intellectual stimulation piece. Would that be fair to say that that is kind of it, the driver, it is, it, it the motivation to, driver? Okay. So it really fulfills my ego requirement. So okay. let, let me just tell you a story. So yeah. I belong to this group from Stanford called the Mayfield Fellows. And that group was, they only accept 12 students a year. This back when I was in school. And the goal was for you to start a VC backed startup. And so I get invited to these parties every single year where we meet up and everyone's like, oh yeah, I just had a $400 million exit. I just had a billion dollar exit. Kevin Systrom is part of that group, you know, of Instagram. And meanwhile, I go there and I'm like, yeah, I'm selling handkerchiefs. And I always feel really silly. Like I don't belong there. And so for me, like I know that I could start something or, or have something really huge if I applied all of my time to it. But, you know, my family is my priority. So the way I satisfy my ego is I take on these projects, mm -hmm. keep my mind stimulated, and and have these achievements. Mm -hmm. And now a quick message from one of our sponsors. These are our hiring goals, they say. They're very aggressive. But when everyone looks to you, you're calm. Why? Because you know you don't need a miracle. You need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. Indeed's hiring platform helps you easily schedule and conduct virtual interviews all in one place. And Indeed streamlines hiring with powerful matching tools that find you matched candidates fast. 
On Indeed, over 85% of employers find quality candidates whose resumes match their job description the moment that they sponsor a job, according to Indeed data. One of the things that I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place so easy because the moment you post a job on Indeed, you get a short list of quality candidates whose resumes match your job description, and you can even invite them to apply right away. So start hiring now with a $100 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash build wealth. Offer is good for a limited time. Again, you can claim your $100 credit now at indeed.com slash build wealth. Terms and conditions apply. And now back to the show. Do you ever think though, it should not be about the ego? That should not even be part of the equation? Does that, do you ever think about I mean, that? it, 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 you can say that, but I think we all have it, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we all want to be the best at what we do. Right. So at, at least that's me. Mm-hmm. So as long as I'm learning something constantly, then that usually satisfies my ego requirement. Mm-hmm. I'm curious for you. I mean, why do you do what you do if, if you've achieved financial independence? Very similar answer to what you said. Uh, like, so in my case, podcasting, I would say, and then the summit as well. It's really me interviewing different experts on subjects that are of interest to me. I I really enjoy learning. And if I find if I'm progressing and getting better at something, I'm happier. If I get stagnant at something, I get actually depressed. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. so for yep. so for me like to be straight here I, I'm not exaggerating like it actually can lead to depression and it gets it can get bad. So I've learned that I I need that to to actually be be happy and and feel fulfilled and so for me personally the challenge is how do you craft because it's not really about the money yeah. anymore so it's more how do you craft the podcast the financial summit that I run so that you're doing the part that makes you happy and fulfilled and checks kind of those boxes in terms of creative intellectual stimulation, progress, getting back, like something about mastery too, right? Just getting mastery, I find also makes you happy and fulfilled. At least that's the case for me. And so it's about how do we get that and not do the things you don't want to do, right? So like whether it's outsourcing or automating things of that nature, I find that to be the main thing. I've sort of learned that you, I can't just do the whole relaxation thing because it's very unfulfilling. And it also feels like wasted potential as well. Um, yeah. And I, and there's also like a certain degree of privilege where it's like, okay, there's some people that were just born in different parts of the world. Just by luck, I happen to be here in a developed country with opportunities, things like that. I'm in Canada, so we get the healthcare. <laughs> you know what I mean? So there's, yeah. certain, there's certain things that, and so to do nothing and just squander that, like obviously I worked hard to get where we are, but I, but there's obviously a luck element too, like it is in any business. And so it would just feel I, w- I would feel irresponsible and wasteful to just let that go and just relax and do nothing and like contribute nothing to society. That that bothers me because I feel like I have a bit of an obligation uh, there. So anyways, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, I just want to always be ma- trying to master something. And it, again, yeah. I, I call that kind of like fulfilling my ego requirement because you know I, I do hang out with a lot of people who are super successful. And I've interviewed... I don't know, 450 people on my podcast. And I've just found that even though they're super successful in business, a lot of them just aren't happy with their lives because there's something missing also in in that respect. So uh, the way I think about it is I I, kind of structure my life based on what what my perfect week is like. So if I can have lunch with my wife, if I can go on a walk with the kids, if I'm playing sports with them, I'm working out, and I'm doing work, it's a good week for me. Mm-hmm. And that's what I strive for pretty much. Mm-hmm. Like I don't need very much. Gotcha. Was there anything that surprised you after you hit your financial independence number? I'm sure there was a point where you did the math in Excel or whatever, and you came to the realization of, okay, I could just sell this thing and live off my, you know, invested in some ETFs like index funds and just live off the investments, you know, that kind of a thing. Once you kind of hit that financial independence number and you realize that's an option, you know, were there any sort of surprises that you had? Like mine was that I actually can't just relax all the time. It would makes me actually makes me unhappy, which is like counterintuitive. You know, was there anything like that for you that surprised you once you've hit that milestone? You, you know, what's funny is uh, that first year with our business, our goal was just 60K. Mm-hmm. And that 60K would have been enough. 
And then when we exceeded it, we just, like I said, I got this fever because we yep. were growing at like triple digits every year in the beginning. And, and I just got so consumed by it. And I loved it. I loved every minute of it. Like we sell handkerchiefs, which is not masculine. It's not something I'm even interested in. Mm -hmm. Right. But it doesn't really matter what you sell. Just the, the process of starting that business, the challenge of it makes it super fun. And I didn't want it to stop. And, and the money coming in was just kind of like this measuring stick. I mean, even though we didn't really need it after a certain point, it just felt good. Mm -hmm. So I, I, no surprises. Really. I never had a number. Like I always knew from like a young age that I wasn't going to be lying on the beach. And Okay. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. I, I wish I knew that. <laughs> it would have made the journey a lot more fun because my, my, <laughs> my mind was more like, just go at it, get there, sacrifices, and then you get there and you can relax. And then six months after you're like, oh crap, I, that was actually not very efficient because I could have, if I knew I was going to keep running the podcast and the conference, I could have just Taken it like you know, actually focused more on enjoying the journey instead of just looking at the end goal and focusing on that and going full out. So that's awesome that you actually had that, that you knew that early on. That <laughs> I think it was just the way I was brought up. Like my parents just kind of brought me up to to be to get used to like the grind. Mm -hmm. Like I I did some insane things as a kid. Looking back now, like they made me study for the SATs in fourth grade. You guys probably do. You guys have SATs? I mean, we do not know. No, yeah, you don't, but it's like the standardized test, yeah. right? So we get all the American don't... media though. So all Canadians yeah. know what it is, I think. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Anyway, <laughs> we watch yeah, American so I... movies. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was so I could get into this camp that would get me ahead. And so I was studying a lot when, when my friends were outside playing. And so I kind of got used to that, uh, getting used to like, I mean, to be quite frank, getting used to doing stuff that wasn't necessarily fun all the time. Mm -hmm. And just doing that on a constant basis. And I guess what most people don't realize is starting a business or a podcast or whatever, it's not fun all the time. In fact, most of the time, it's it's kind of like the grind. It's not necessarily fun. For example, like the podcast, like the editing and everything. I mean, that's got to happen, but that's not fun. The fun part is interviewing somebody, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different things. Like the book that I just finished, writing it wasn't necessarily fun. I mean, it took forever. But this part is fun, the the, uh, the marketing and, and seeing the results. Mm -hmm. so. And would it be fair to say that, because you mentioned that was like a bucket list item, so were you also striving just to get that sort of experience? Was it also to satisfy some curiosity? Like, hey, what would it be like to have a traditionally published book you know, with a major publisher, go through that process, maybe try to be a best-selling author, that kind of a thing? Was that an element as well, where it was just kind of curiosity, getting some like a fun life experience so that when you're 80 looking back, you can say, Hey, that was pretty cool. I, I took that on. Do you, do you find that? Cause that, that, that's the thing that I try to do when I reflect on these things is kind of yeah. like, okay, when I'm 80 am I like regret minimization is kind of the way I like to approach it too. Do you do that kind of a thing as well? Or do you, or something else maybe? Uh, for some reason, it's always been on my bucket list to write the book. Mm -hmm. And I've always had this dream of taking my kids to the bookstore and showing them my book on the shelf. Mm -hmm. uh, I also have a little bit of, I guess, childhood, trauma in a way like my mom uh i've been blogging for over a decade now and she doesn't she hasn't really read any of my stuff she doesn't listen to the podcast she doesn't watch any youtube videos and having this traditionally published book was the first time where she truly understood what i did and she was excited about the mm -hmm. book and so that that's validation for me there too yeah 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 i, I hear you the, the the parent thing is a yeah it's like a whole nother animal <laughs> Yeah, it's like exactly. it, at least for me, it shouldn't matter as but it, as much as, as it does, but it does because it's there's, there, I think it's like the family, you know, the link. And I, I hear you, I hear you. We got some more questions, but maybe you know, you mentioned your book a few times. I don't even know if we mentioned the title yet. So, maybe, oh, yeah, yeah, maybe let's let's do that. Um, I'll mention it in the intro as well. And so, everybody listening now, sure. you would have heard it already, but just yeah, I don't want people to forget because yeah, I've, I'm, I'm loving it so far and I want to help you however I, I can. So, so the book is called The Family First Entrepreneur, How to Achieve Financial Freedom Without Sacrificing What Matters Most. Here's what I've just here's the reason why I wrote the book. I wrote it because while I was running my businesses and you know, reading a lot of business books and studying other entrepreneurs, I noticed that most advice out there about entrepreneurship is given by single guys who have no responsibilities whatsoever, and they can work like 80 hours a week, right, to get things done. But that didn't apply to me because I got kids and I actually want to see them. Yeah. 
right? And so a lot of the advice, like the hustle advice, especially, just didn't apply to me. So I wanted to write a book that could show people that you can make a lot of money without having to work as hard, right? So I run two seven-figure businesses today working less than 20 hours a week. And if you have the systems in place, and if all you want to do is make like a few million dollars, let's say, you can do that with very few employees and without without you know working 80 hours a week. Now, of course, if you want to start like a huge company like Amazon or Facebook, then yes, you're probably going to have to work 80 hours a week. But I've interviewed 100 and, uh, 450 people. Most people get started in business for freedom. Like they're not trying to become a billionaire. And I would say that's probably the case for most people all over the world. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. And um, in regards to your, you interviewing the whole 450 people, that's that's just on the My Wolf Cutter Job podcast, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. That's, so that's in, correct. The, in there, when you've interviewed them, I mean, I, I've listened to many of those interviews there. Some of these people are incredibly successful. I'm sure they're financially independent just because you know some of them have, have had big exits, things of that nature. Have you noticed after interviewing that many people, certain commonalities among them in regards to what keeps them going? Why do they, like we've already been talking about this, you and I, and the kind of from that angle, right. but have you noticed commonalities among those in terms of what keeps them going? What keeps them motivated? Why do they keep working? Do you have anything to say about that maybe? You know, what's funny is uh, I've had a bunch of people on the pod that have had big exits. And I sometimes I get them right after the exit. And then I ask them, hey, so what are you going to do now? And they're like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to take it easy for a year and do nothing and whatnot. And then lo and behold, three months later, they started something else, <laughs> right? Because I think it's the same thing that we just talked about. They, they need to be stimulated. They need to be working on something. They need to be building something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And here's the other thing I've noticed, like if we're just talking about character traits of people who are successful, the people who are successful, they take action on things and they just gut it out, right? A lot of these people I have on my podcast, it's taken like at least five years for them to be successful. There's very few people that I interview that achieve, you know, success within a year or, or you know, a little bit more than that. And if they do, it's actually quite miserable. I, won't, I once interviewed this guy who achieved like $2 million in revenue in like six months. Hmm. And like the whole episode was, you know, congratulating him and whatnot. But as soon as I hit the the stop button, I asked him, you know, how sucky was that? He was like, oh my God, it was the most stressful time of my life. Hmm. I mean, you don't hear about those stories. Is it because the rapid scale of the business, he wasn't prepared for it, didn't have the systems in place? Correct. And so it's, well, kind of like what you and your wife went through when you guys, you guys were on, uh, was it the Daily Show? The Today Show, yeah. Today Show, yeah. And then you got a big burst of orders. And it's like, okay, we weren't ready for this volume yet. <laughs> and so it becomes a stressful thing, right? It's not fun to grow fast. Uh, that's what most people don't realize. It sounds glamorous, but it actually sucks. What you want to do is you want to grow at a sustainable pace kind of gradually. And that's what makes it a lot more fun and easier to run a business. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you brought up this this other path, right? Because I think maybe especially for some of the younger individuals listening to this uh, podcast, and then I went to business school and kind of the whole narrative there was, yeah, you go and you start, you know, you look, they look at the Amazons and the Googles, you know, you're going for these big change the world type businesses and getting finance, you know, get funding and IPOs and all that. And that's kind of where the, the narrative was, that's sort of where the focus was. Cause it's, I guess it's a lot more glamorous and, and such. Right. But I like how with your approach, you're saying, okay, like that's one way to maybe reach financial independence because then you could sell eventually and you're, you're financial independent, but that's not the only path. It's the, there's also this other path, like in your case, where you're building these, you know, still like a small business quotation marks yeah. here compared to those, but it's more sustainable. It's more focused on lifestyle and then just being sustainable and actually being like happy and having some balance in your life instead of just, we're going all in. Because you know we're trying to hit a billion dollar valuation at one point or something, you know, or something crazy, like that. I mean, I optimize for sleeping at night. Really, for me, I I have the engineering background, so I'll full on code stuff to make things easier because mm-hmm. I can do that. Uh, you can hire people to do that if you're not a coder. Uh, I have uh, I, I do a lot of SOPs. Like I have our my employees like when they do something, they just I have them document what they're doing so that in the event that they leave. We have this set of documents that someone someone else comes in, we can just get them right up to speed by reading the documents. So yeah, 
again, like I said, if you want to start the next Amazon or the next billion dollar company, you're probably going to have to work 80, 100 hour weeks and hire employees and all that stuff. But as I mentioned before, if all you want to do is make a few million dollars a year, you can totally do that without having to go through all that. And now a quick message from one of our sponsors. There are so many opinions on how to invest your money today, but it can be hard to find credible voices to rely on in the world of finance and investing. One resource that I turn to every week is the ETF Market Insights YouTube channel led by today's episode sponsor, BMO ETFs. Market Insights brings in industry experts and the weekly episodes cover the hottest themes like inflation, infrastructure, healthcare, and more. Tuning in helps me stay up to date on what's happening so I can be a smarter investor. And you can also submit your own ETF questions to be answered on the show. So do yourself a favor and subscribe on YouTube to ETF Market Insights or visit ETFMarketInsights.com so you can be notified when future episodes go live. And now back to the show. What are your sources of fulfillment in what I call semi-retirement in your case? What what have you found to generate the most meaning in your life after hitting that financial independence number? Yeah. So now it's kind of just all shifted towards the kids. Like when they achieve something, I share in their achievement. Like I I used to play club volleyball and my kids are both into volleyball right now. And I've been working with them. So when they made the club team, I was more excited than they were. Mm -hmm. Or when they played really well in a game, uh, we just got back from a tournament in in Reno, actually, and my daughter played really well. Like, I feel arguably more happy than she does when she (laughs) plays well. So that's where my a lot of my fulfillment is these days. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I find the same thing. I'm a volleyball guy, too. So I I hear you. You are. Nice. (laughs) What what position do you play? Um, I haven't played for, it was just oh, no, no, back, back in the day. Oh, like yeah. well, b- back in the day, but pre COVID, I was playing some beach volleyball, but it was just like intramurals. Like, you know, you just rotate. Okay. And, yeah. Nice. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Very like <laughs> not, not too competitive and stuff, but, um, but, but I hear what you're saying because my, my, like, I just got my daughter in the scouts and that's something that I did when I was younger, like, you know, the whole camping wilderness survival yep, thing. Yep. And, and I hear what you're saying. Cause for the same thing, like sometimes I felt, I just took her to her first camp and I felt I was maybe even more, like she was excited, but I feel I was maybe even more excited because, you know, it's the nostalgia and you get to like kind of live through them in that sort of way. And you know, they're going to have good experiences. So uh, I, I hear you. I, I'm, I definitely get a huge sense of fulfillment from that as well, which I, I, didn't, I didn't know it would be that great, but it's, it's, it's fascinating how, <laughs> how the mind works when you're a parent, right? <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And from those that you interviewed, have you noticed any patterns in terms of what tends to add the most fulfillment to them um, in terms of, you know, like the purpose, their happiness, once the money is no longer a priority, have you found that their experience is similar to yours or, and you come Yeah, you know, I would say, I would say this, maybe saying the majority is a little bit too strong of a term, but let's just use that word. I'd say a lot of the people that I interview are missing something in their life. Like they have all the business and they have the money in place, but they're missing something else. Like, a, a female companion or a male companion, or they're having problems, uh, you know, starting a family and that sort of thing. Or what they have is just like they're they're kicking butt, but what they have is just they're just not one hundred percent satisfied with it, and they're just looking for that next thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the people that are fulfilled have realized and found what that enough point is, and I think until you figure out what that is or what makes you happy. You're always going to be looking for that next thing. Mm. Uh, and, and I don't mean enough in terms of like a dollar amount, like you what you asked earlier. I mean enough in terms of what you do on a day-to-day that, that keeps you happy or what you need. Oh, okay. Okay. So hitting sort of that different buckets that you know make you feel happy and Correct. fulfilled. How, how much do I need of each one? Correct. Be happy. So that, I'm guessing that could be like health and then time with kids, time with wife, time with friends, business yeah. for like that intellectual creative stimulation, let's say, and mastery. Am I, I'm kind of paraphrasing here. Is, is that what you meant? Yeah, for the most part, yes. Okay. Because you can't assign like a dollar number because that's generally not going to ever be fulfilling for you. Gotcha. You're just going to hit that number and move the goalposts. Okay. Whereas the other things that you just mentioned... I mean, those end up being more important. You have to you have to have elements of all of those things in order to be fulfilled mm-hmm. and happy. 
Awesome. Yeah, I didn't want to gloss over what you just said a second ago too about how the more money thing never actually is the answer. That seems to be a that's a common thing, right? Because you said like the goal was just move. You, you hit you hit six figures. Now you want to try seven figures, seven, right? And, that, and that just how many zeros can yeah? And it becomes and you said it. It's never it's never enough. And someone's always going to have more. So now if you're comparing yourself to them, you're never really it's never good enough. Meanwhile, your health relationships all that could be suffering in the meantime. So. Um, you know what's funny? A lot of it has to do with your peer group. So I have a buddy of mine who felt like he was poor in California, moved to Kansas, <laughs> and now he feels like a king. Yeah, and he's much happier. It's 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 really about your environment too. Yeah, right? yeah, so. yeah. You're, you're hearing people like oh, oh, they got some equity in Google or whatever after joining, selling it, things of that, or some startup, right? And then <laughs> I could see how that'd be like, oh, well, they're the same age as me. Why didn't I get that kind of money yet? And then it's, it's almost like implying maybe you did something wrong, right? Uh, just like the nature of comparing yourself to others. And like, like yeah, yeah I, I, I hear you. So one question I had too is, I mean, one could argue that every hour you spend growing your business is an hour that you could be, let's say, spending with your with, with your kids, let's say, or if they're at school, then you could be doing your favorite hobbies. So like I know you're into Ultimate Frisbee, just listening to your podcast and all that. So like you could be playing more Ultimate Frisbee instead of writing the book or work, you know, the YouTube channel or whatever new project you're going to take on after the book stuff's done. Um, so do you like running businesses more than doing more of your hobbies, or do they just check off different buckets when it comes to fulfillment? And so it's just kind of what you do to, you know, to sort of be yeah. have a holistic thing where you're you're just happy in all the different areas here's the thing, everything in moderation, right? Like I'm an old man now. I can't play <laughs> ultimate for more than an hour. Okay. Gotcha. Um, you, you mentioned time with the family. A lot of times they don't want to hang out with you, right? <laughs> I mean, you can't spend all your time with family. You just drive each other crazy. I, yeah. I think the most important part with family, since you brought it up is just being present, right? You might not necessarily be actively hanging out, but you're there if they need you. Mm -hmm. And this is, I, I remember when I was young, I mentioned I played club volleyball. I used to go to the, all these traveling tournaments and my parents were working because, you know, they were trying to make a living. And I would look on the sideline, especially when I made a great play. And oh, a lot yeah. of times they weren't there. That's tough. Yeah. And so th that's why I try to make all my kids games. Like we're not hanging out all the time, but I'm just there, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and I think that's important. Yeah. And I, like my other hobbies and whatnot, like I just can't do them. More. Like I, I know like the optimal time, let's we'll take ultimate. My optimal time is I can play 90 minutes. And then I, after that game, I have to sleep the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> so I remember I you mentioned that on your show or, or with Tony. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't do any more of that. Yeah. I, and I, I can't play. Like, it takes me two days to recover, too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everything has its limits. And you yeah. just got to find out what, what that optimal amount of time is mm -hmm. for everything. Yeah, it's very interesting because I, I ran into that myself where it's like, okay, I could be doing something to grow the podcast, let's say. But okay, it's a nice day outside. I yes, I already went. Like I'm, I'm a mountain biker. Like that's my ultimate frisbee is mountain biking. So, okay, I already went yesterday. I don't need to go again today. But hey, I I could. So it's like, well, why don't I just do more mountain biking? Why would I be working on the business when I don't need to? And it's fun, but it's the mountain biking thing is really fun. <laughs> like I would right, say, yeah, you're yeah. More, like I'm a, I'm a I'm a adrenaline junkie when it comes to that. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so that's kind of where my question's coming from is that's something that I've, and again, it's trying to get balance, trying to, you know, cause, cause like you said, you can't just be doing it all the time, but yeah, that's one area where I'm kind of, okay. If, if you don't need the money, you enjoy both, but you kind of maybe enjoy the hobby a bit more. Why not just do that? I mean, here's the thing. I, I always think about like the opportunity costs, like you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned growing your podcast. Yeah. I always think to myself, okay, how is that going to improve my life if I grow my podcast? Like, well, what's really going to change? Right. And most of the time for me, like we can talk about my podcast. It won't matter one bit, whether I grow the podcast, like 10%, 20% or whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, I run my podcast to meet other people. And okay. that's the purpose of it. Right. Um, let me see if I can think of some other examples in business. Like what is that? incremental like let's say i can do something that makes an additional 100k is that 100k really going to change my life like is there something i'm saving up for right at this moment where that's going to really help the answer is no for me because 
Well, after I bought my house, which was the one big purchase that I had to make, I don't really, I don't really have any other big purchases lined up, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so yeah, the, like the money is just kind of like a scorecard at this point. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the other question I had. Well, I mean, because you could be taking on other, like, hey, maybe you're into going to try some other sport or, you know what I mean? Like you could be doing these other things that you suspect might be fun, <laughs> right? But you're like, no, I'm going to do this business. I'm going to work on my YouTube channel or no, I'm going to write a book, right? And, and you said- I mean, here's the thing about like the channel and the podcast, and I'm sure you felt this too. It's very rewarding. Yeah. You know that someone's listening, especially when you get emails that say, hey, I, this episode changed my life. Oh yeah, or, yeah. For sure. What I'm hoping to achieve is like this book changed my life. You know, when people get okay. their hands on it. And that's that's fun. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. There's also something about working hard for something that takes a long time. Like this book took me three years and I think it's because it took so long that it's even more rewarding to me. Mm -hmm. If I just pumped out that book in like a week, I don't know if I'd feel the same way about it. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's something yeah. to be said about working a long time on a project and finally seeing it get completed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that for sure. It, kind of piggybacking on that. Can you talk about how you evaluate opportunities and what your thought process is when considering a new project. So for example, what was your thought process when deciding whether you should write the book or not, or start your YouTube channel? Um, you know, because again, especially you don't need the money anymore. So like you, you already answered the one about the book, I, th right. I think. Right. Um, but like for something like the YouTube channel, that's a recurring time commitment. Correct. Yeah. No matter how optimized it is. And so was it because, again, because it's a fun new challenge, you think you'd enjoy it, you're going to learn um, a bunch of new things, you wanted that plaque. <laughs> I did want the plaque. I know. I, I did know. want the plaque. I did want the plaque. I see it behind you, actually. In the, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, okay, let's talk about the YouTube channel specifically. Yeah. I'm thinking a like lot a, of a times, framework, like what's your decision-making framework where it's like, we have opportunity X, should I yeah. take this on? So for YouTube, I've always felt like the world was just moving towards video and I didn't want to get left behind in that respect. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like a defensive play really. Um, because these days, the best way to build rapport with an audience for my wife quit her job is for someone to see and hear you. So if you're still just blogging or if you're just doing podcasting, which is, you know, just from the ear, I think the video is the best medium right now. Mm -hmm. and also you get the biggest bang for your buck so this this is how i like to think if, if i'm going to spend time doing something i want to make sure that i can get as much benefit out of that as possible youtube just happens to be the best in terms of proliferating your content and ironically i think podcasting is the worst right it's hard to grow a podcast because there's no real platforms out there that help you distribute the content this is why i don't like social media Social media is something that you got to do every day. And when you stop, the traffic stops. Yeah. So my friends who are doing well with social media, I have a friend who posts seven times a day on Instagram. I have a friend who posts 21 times a day on Facebook. They're killing it, but that just sounds like a hamster wheel for me. Yeah, yeah. It, to me as well, it sounds like a job at that point. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I like SEO and blogging. This is why I've been blogging for so long. I have a post that I wrote 10 years ago, still gets traffic. Mm -hmm. YouTube's the same way. I have videos that I posted three years ago still get a ton of traffic and views. Mm -hmm. So I try to focus on things that scale well. And and YouTube in particular was kind of like a defensive play because that's where I feel like everything's going mm -hmm. towards video. Gotcha. So so you looked at sort of the trend and where things are going. Are yeah. there other things that you, I mean, I'm sure there are, that you factor into the equation? Is it, am I going to dread doing this? That is it going to be fun? Am I learning things I want to learn? You know, you know what I mean? Are there things yeah, yeah, of yeah. that nature as well that made you, I'm trying to get inside your brain on so, how you, yeah, make, yeah, because so you're in a position like, to, to a, like where you, I'm sure you get like tons of opportunities flying at you all the time. You know, people wanting to partner with you and do a joint thing on this and a joint thing on that. You get so much in your inbox in terms of these quote unquote opportunities. Some are great, some are garbage, but okay. How do you effectively and then there's other and then i'm sure your brain like mine is always working as well coming up with ideas sure. never stops so then how do you then take all of those inputs or all that you know all that i guess not noise but opportunities let's call them and then say okay 
how do I process yeah. all of that and actually say, okay, I'm actually going to settle on YouTube. And like you said, I'm going to focus on that for a year, you know, yeah. with that level. Of, Cause then you're saying no to all these other things. How do you decide? All right. So you mentioned a bunch of things in that question. So number one partnerships, I try not to do partnerships because humans are unpredictable, right? Yeah. So I, I stick to automation and, and, and computers if I can. Okay. Uh, I do have a partner, Tony, but yep. it was rare because I we're we're really close friends, and I knew there'd be none of that crazy stuff going on. Um, YouTube, I always go into every project knowing that it's going to suck in the beginning, okay. right? Because this is just the way it is. Like when I first played Ultimate, I sucked at it, and when you suck at something, you don't like it as much. And, and this is what I do with my kids. Like my kids, the first time they do something, they're like, "I don't want to do that ever again." But I make them suffer through it until they get reasonably good at it. And then all of a sudden it becomes fun. Volleyball was exactly like that. They didn't like it. They're like, oh, my arm hurts, whatever. But you have yeah, to get yeah, over yeah. that. Hump. That's what happens at initial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, with YouTube, I, I went in. Like, I don't take on any project unless I know I'm going to stick with it for at least three to five years. And so YouTube, I, I felt like it was a necessary thing for me to do just for the future sustainability of everything. And it was something I wanted to learn also. Mm -hmm. And I went into it going, okay, it's going to suck, especially the first year because you're going to be working hard. You don't have any systems in place and you're not going to see any results. Like my videos were getting like probably like 100, 100 views in the beginning and I'd spend all this time on it. Oh, it's, it's brutal. I remember like first days of yeah. podcasting, you put all this work in and it's just, the, the, the volume is so small. Like why? <laughs> yeah. But then it pays off long-term, yeah. It pays off long-term. So- you just got to think about that end goal and know that you're going to know that it's going to suck. I think a lot of times it's about expectations. So when people take my class, they, you see all these YouTube videos about get, getting rich quick and everything. They're like, all right, how much money can I make in like three months or a month? And I'm like, hey, if you go in with that attitude into my class, you're for sure going to fail because a month will pass by and you'll be like, hey, I didn't make any progress. and I must be doing something wrong. This isn't for me. So I always try to make people take the mindset. It was like, hey, you got to stick with this for a year, at least minimum, and good things will happen. Because usually it takes about a year for you to get semi good at something, or at least good enough so that you're excited to follow through. Yeah. I, I like that. Yeah. The, the, the one year time frame. I remember Noah Kagan. Um, he has that, I think it's like a hundred, like a hundred rule. I don't know what he officially calls it, but it's like, if you're going to start a podcast, focus on, you're going to do a hundred episodes or like a hundred. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's and, his thing. Yeah. Which, which I, which I think is sort of similar to what you're saying, where you're not expecting, Oh, I'm going to write one blog post and make all this money. It's more, it's a, it's a thing that you keep practicing. You keep getting better. The whole mastery thing, the consistency thing, incremental improvements. And then that's how you sort of get to there. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. mean, I think I put these videos private now, but some of my early videos, horrible. Like I, <laughs> I go back and watch them. Uh, uh, you know, I've come a long way in like yeah. the last three, three years or so, so. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. Well, uh, Steve, thanks so much for, for coming on. This has been really, really uh, fascinating for me. Uh, can you tell us again, where we can we get your book, your podcast, anything else that you think listeners of the, of the show will get good value from? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, order the book over at thefamilyfirstentrepreneur.com. I'm actually giving out $690 in bonuses. So if you sign up and order the book, fill out a form over at thefamilyfirstentrepreneur.com. Um, I will send you a three-day workshop on how to get started in e-commerce, a two-day workshop on how to make passive income with podcasting, blogging, and YouTube, which is what I do. And in June, I'm actually giving this six-week, what I call Family First Challenge, where I'll be in a private Facebook group and help walk you through to find your next side hustle. Because I sincerely believe that everyone needs to have a side hustle today. Uh, you can also find me over at mywifequitterjob.com. I do also offer a free six-day mini course there as well. Uh, I have a podcast called My Wife Quitter Job. Uh, the YouTube channel is the same name. And if you guys ever want to hang out in person, I also run an annual e-commerce event called the Seller Summit. And in the event that you guys are getting married, I'll hook you up with some handkerchiefs uh, over <laughs> at right. bumblebeelinens.com. <laughs> <laughs> good, good diversification. Uh, <laughs> awesome. All right, Steve. Uh, well, that, that's been great. It's been lots of fun. I'll definitely link out to everything in the show notes. Uh, I'm going to go, uh, as soon as we get off, I'll go leave a review 
for your book as well. Um, loving it so far. And uh, yeah, thanks again for coming on and sharing your expertise with us and sharing this different path that people can take. I think it's great. You know, if you want to start the next Google, go for it, sure. But it, it's nice to hear that that's not the only way to do it. There's other paths and it's a matter of knowing the pros and cons of each. And then you can actually pick and choose which one you think is the best for you. So I really appreciate what you're doing in terms of just transparency and just being straight with people about the work required. It's not get rich quick, none of that stuff, different options. It's really nice to speak with people like yourself in this space where it's no fluff and you tell it like it is. And then then it's great to learn from you and your experience as well. So thanks again. All right. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care, Steve. Bye. All right. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Please share it with someone that you think may find it useful. And of course, leaving a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify is always super appreciated as well. I'd like to end with a big thanks to two of our sponsors who, apart from my investing course, literally keep the entire Build Wealth Canada podcast and website free for you. Our first sponsor is BMO ETFs. Do you know why asset allocation ETFs have become so popular? Asset allocation explains over 90% of the variation in a portfolio's quarterly returns. So it's no wonder Canadian investors are turning to these ETFs. Today's sponsor, BMO ETFs, offers these innovative all-in-one solutions with the BMO All Equity ETF, ZEQT, BMO Growth ETF, ZGRO, BMO Balanced ETF, ZBAL, BMO Conservative ETF, ZCON, and more. BMO developed these to help provide investors with ETFs that offer broad diversification, and they're also low-cost and simple to use. These ETFs invest in a number of underlying index-based ETFs and are rebalanced automatically back to your set asset allocation or mix of stocks and bonds. They offer a hands-free approach to investing that is built on disciplined weights to provide exposure to different geographies and sectors all in one solution. BMO actually offers eight asset allocation ETFs, and you can learn more at BMOETFs.com. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. Indeed's hiring platform helps you easily schedule and conduct virtual interviews all in one place. And it streamlines hiring with powerful matching tools that find you matched candidates fast. On Indeed, over 85% of employers find quality candidates whose resume matches their job description the moment that they sponsor a job, according to Indeed data. One of the things that I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place so easy because Indeed does the hard work for you. It gets you one step closer to the hire by immediately matching you with quality candidates on the platform. Even better, Indeed's the only job site where you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. And Indeed is an unbelievably powerful hiring partner, delivering eight times more hires than all other job sites combined, according to TalentNest 2019. So start hiring now with a $100 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash build wealth. Offer is good for a limited time. Again, you can claim your $100 credit now at Indeed dot com slash build wealth terms and conditions apply thanks for listening to the build wealth canada podcast at www.buildwealthcanada.ca